So welcome back, everybody, to Integrate Yourself. We're your hosts, Allison Pillow and Maya Gottlieb. You can find me, Allison, at pureenergypdx.com, and you can find Maya at mayagottlieb.com. Today, we're here with a wonderful guest, Dr. Toomey Johnson. Uh, Dr. Toomey Johnson is MD, is a physician, dancer, and poet. She is board certified in internal medicine, a diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine, and was made an assistant clinical professor of medicine of New, uh, NYU in 2011. She has been a yoga practitioner for over 20 years and completed yoga teacher training with Yoga Works in 2012. A graduate of the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, Dr. Johnson also has extensive nutrition expertise. With past experience running a weight management clinic in New York City, Toomey has served in West Africa as a Doctors Without Borders field doctor in nutrition clinics there as well. Her holistic medicine medical practice is focused on helping people identify the underlying causes of their health issues. She then uses her expertise to offer individualized holistic regimens that support people in achieving and sustaining their most vibrant well-being through her plant-based health plans. She has had many patients heal issues ranging from diabetes to hormonal imbalances to persistent weight challenges. As a dancer, Dr. Johnson creates and performs dance pieces crafted from original poetry that are intended to help the healing process of those who witness the dance. Her healing dances and presentations have been performed in France, Haiti, Africa, Asia, and throughout the U.S. Dr. Johnson is dedicated to empowering others in their journeys of personal health, peace, and happiness, and recently published a holistic wellness guidebook called Delicious Healing. She is currently on a book dance tour of Delicious Healing, and welcome, Dr. Timmy Johnson. We are so happy you're here. Uh, we're honored that you're here on our show today, so thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Allison and Maya, and I just want to say I'm honored to be here, and I want to just take a moment and say thank you for the wonderful work that you both do through this podcast. Oh, thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, the reason I wanted to give you that long intro that was just so beautiful is because I want everybody to know um, the experience that you have. When I read your bio, I was so impressed and I was so um, so curious and intrigued. I had so much intrigue about um, uh, kind of your dance and how you use it to heal people and and the poetry that goes with it. I watched some of your videos and and they were beautiful. And Thank you. not to mention the fact that you're 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 a holistic MD and you you try to help people find other avenues besides just pharmaceuticals, which is a big deal and not it's very unheard of in your industry as well. So we thank you for, for doing that and being that kind of a doctor because we need more of you out there for sure. I so appreciate those words. And I, I want to say, you know, one, one of the entomologies, the entomology of healing um, is, is connected to the word whole, you know, W-H-O-L-E. Yeah. And, you know, one thing about that that resonates with me is that I think a lot of times it was my early experience was this idea of this false idea that we are one thing or the other, one thing or the other. And I remember as a young dancer and poet, I was also very much um, impassioned and, and, and really in love with biology and the body and healing. And sometimes people will say to me, including some professors, well, you're an amazing dancer, you need to go in this realm, or you're an amazing at science, so go into being a doctor. And it was so hard for me to choose. And so I chose not to choose. I chose to um, go after the things that stirred me, stirred me, my passions that made me come alive. And um, I think that that is what has stood me in such good stead. And, and, and part of the work I feel like I do is hopefully inspiring people to be their whole selves. Because I can share with you that I'm a better dancer because I'm a doctor and I'm a better doctor because I'm a dancer. Mm. And the only reason for those that that is because I'm doing what I love to do. Mm, that's, oh, that's awesome. Be that's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. And I feel that way too, because on a personal level, uh, I have my foot in a lot of different realms and dimensions and areas that I, that interests me. And, and you're right. Like you're told when you're younger, you got to, if, 
you got to go into one avenue and that just doesn't yeah. feel right to me. So, and I, and I'm also a, a dancer and, and I, I love that you put those two things together because they are, they are meant to be together. The, the study of the body is, is and the, the physiology, the, the biology of the body, it's such an art form in some ways, if you think about Absolutely. it, and it's much like a dance, you know? So, Absolutely. um, God, it's just, that's so great. I, I, I really, really love how you, how you put that all together. So, yeah. Well, I want to share that it wasn't like an overnight process at yeah. all as, as, as things usually are. And for a very long time, I would go to, I was a part of a dance company in New York. And when I would go to um, rehearsal or performances, I was like, now I'm a dancer. And then I would go to the clinic or the hospital. I'm like, now I'm a doctor. And one of the most powerful transformative moments for me was when I was a field physician working with Doctors Without Borders in West Africa. I was working in Niger there for nine months. And every morning I would wake up and do my dance practice to keep my skills up because I had to go back to New York and, and dance with the company. And also it's what kept me feeling grounded um, during a very busy time. And then I would go to the hospital and try to offer my medical services. And I have a whole, there's a whole story around this, but basically at one moment I, I hired a griot um, through MSF to come to the clinics and play music for the mothers and children who were in the hospital because there'd been some great research about how stimulation could help some of these children. Mm -hmm. And when the griot came and started playing music, some of the mothers began to dance yeah. and one, I remember looked at me and I started to dance. And that was the moment when the doctor's coat and the <laughs> dancer's shoes became one thing. And I realized that my dancing was, was a powerful healing tool as well, that it wasn't meant to be these separate realms. Hmm. That's a special moment to know that you're diverse and yet united. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And when people can look you in the eye and see you other than this, maybe um, this, this being that doesn't maybe understand them because the moms were very much um, overwhelmed by a lot of the Western medical practices that were being offered. And when they saw me dance, that was a language they could understand, a language that we could speak. That's awesome. Because yeah. a lot of times uh, they don't trust you guys. You Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you actually talk about that in your book, right? Taking off the white coat and your yeah. book itself and why. Can you tell us a little story of how, what happened to you and besides mm. your doctor journey, what happens in terms of your life story and where this passion yeah. came from for health? Yes. I think that sometimes um, our most powerful medicine comes from, uh, our history of brokenness or our history of pain. And that's something that I've definitely experienced personally. So as a young child, I have always loved dancing, but I also struggled with pretty severe asthma. And I had a lot of hospitalizations as a child for bad asthma. I was on medication, given steroids for asthma when I was quite little. Um, and then I also had along with that, so there's something called the atopic triad where you can have asthma, but you also probably suffer from eczema, which I do, and then what we call allergic rhinitis. So I had eczema, which would, which looked like very um, itchy and uncomfortable, and for me, unpleasant to look at patches of my skin that were taken over by this dermatitis. So I suffered from eczema and asthma. Those were some physical diseases that I had as a child, and then when I became a young adult, probably in my late teens, I went into a pretty dark depression that got worse and worse over a few years. Um, part of it had to do with a dissolution. My parents, my parents got a divorce and that was really hard for me. Uh, and then there were some other challenges I went through and I went through a lot of mental and emotional pain and the depression felt very strong and got to as dark as it gets, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I 
got to a point where the tools that I was being taught as a medical school student, some of them were amazing. I learned how the body works, physiology and pathology and biochemistry, and those were all amazing tools, but a lot of them didn't feel sufficient to navigate what I was going through. And Along with dancing, around the age of 13, I discovered yoga. I walked into a library and I saw these, this beautiful book with all these beautiful poses. And I thought, what is this book? And it was a book by BKS Iyengar on yoga. Oh, yeah. And I took the book home and I kept renewing the book and renewing the book and renewing the book so I could learn yoga. And so this was in the early 90s, way before yoga kind of took off in the States. And that was the beginning of my journey in yoga. And I found that when I did the breathing exercises and the asana postures, my asthma would get a little bit better. So that began, that began my foray into alternative methods of healing. And I continued to explore that because the tools I was being taught in medical school, while they were amazing, were not sufficient. And they didn't feel like they were addressing the underlying cause of a lot of my issues. Um, yeah. They felt a lot of them, especially when it came to medications like mild butyrol inhaler, like the steroids, they felt like band-aids. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them came with side effects okay. that I wasn't happy with. So creating and crafting and exploring alternative methods for healing my depression, my eczema, my asthma, as well as, and I haven't talked about this yet, my disordered eating behavior. I had an eating disorder that went rampant, became rampant during college. Looking for ways to heal this in a way that was lasting is what led me to the path that I continue to be on um, and, and led me to healing these issues. I have, haven't had eczema now for seven years. I haven't seen my albuterol inhaler for eight years. And my depression, I want to say, is a thing of the past. And I now see my emotions when they come up as teachers rather than something to run away from. That's incredible. So what was, what was it that changed everything for you? Mm. Like, what did you discover? I think, you know, I think it can be different for everybody, but it basically came when I tried to take my own life at the age of 23. Mm -hmm. The depression got so bad that it got to that point. And yeah. I remember lying in the hospital bed and looking out through the hospital window and then being very clear all of a sudden that I wanted my life. Mm. That I wanted my life to look very different than the life that it had become. Mm. And so it doesn't have to get to that point for everyone, but I think you get right. to a moment where you say to yourself, I want to live, but I want yeah. something different. And that's what it looked like for me. And then I began to do a lot of exploration and that exploration um, culminated in crafting basically seven realms, um, which are discussed in the book, my book, Delicious Healing, okay. in which I needed to go into hone and master and shift to be able to live my most delicious life, I call it, which I feel like I'm living. I feel like every day I'm living my best life. And that's a big statement from somebody who not so long ago was literally in the depths of despair. Hmm. So I can share with you that that looked practically like changing my diet completely. And when I came back from my work with Doctors Without Borders, I looked at my own diet and I saw that things had to change. And I started doing more study nutrition, much more study, and it took me deeper and deeper so that I changed my diet to a whole plant foods diet. And it's one that I, you know, everyone is different and I believe in individualized therapy. Um, that being said, you can never go wrong if you're if the base of your diet, at least, is whole, real foods. And doing that for myself was life-changing, was a game-changer. Um, that's, that's so that's great. how it began to change. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you there 100%. And I think that that's, if anybody can start anywhere, it's starting with real food, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, just because that's that's what we're supposed to be eating. We're not supposed to be eating a bunch of chemicals or additives or putting a lot of stuff on our skin. And and a lot of times mine, I talk about how that's just the basics. Don't even worry about the details so yes. much. Just, you know, get the basic like toxins away from you and, and, and start there. Just like, cause you're under so much stress. You're putting your body under so much stress. And then Absolutely. it's funny, like we can't take it anymore. And that's when you get things like the asthma, eczema, right? 
Um, and emotional. And, yes, and the emotional stuff. And it's just, and your body doesn't either, if it doesn't have the nutrients, if you're nutrient deficient, you're also not going to have the ability to combat the stress that's coming at you. So you're not going to have that it's energy. So true. Yeah. I love that you mentioned emotions just now, Maya, and I love, Allison, how you talked about stress. And and food stress emotions are so intimately linked. And I think that a lot of us know, oh, and I, you know, I have patients who come into clinic who have diabetes, cholesterol, they're overweight, they're struggling. And a lot of them know, they know, oh, I should be eating more fruits and vegetables. But it's one thing to maybe intellectually know and even know the studies that are out there. It's another thing to wake up in the morning, have the intention to eat real food, and then actually do it consistently. And that's one thing I work a lot with my patients and my clients is how do you actually do that? Because a lot of us are using food as a way to cope, a lot of us. And I talk a lot about that in the book and I share about it's one thing to know. And yes, focus on nutrient dense foods. Keep it simple, like you said, Alice, and I really believe that. That being said, what happens when stress comes up and you say, well, that apple doesn't look as good as potato chips right now or pizza. What do you do? And that's why I devoted a whole chapter to emotions, to how do you, how do you sit with difficult emotions that come up? How do you make space for that? And then how do you release that so you're no longer using other things like food to cope because you have a coping mechanism? I think this is so right. key. And I think it's not talked about enough, to be honest with you. Um, and those emotions, those difficult emotions that you don't release, literally translate physiologically in the body to increase cortisol. Yes. Which then leads to increased inflammation, as you know, to imbalanced hormones that lead to physical disease. So it's completely connected. Mm -hmm. And telling people to see some vegetables a day, while it's so important, is not enough. Guiding people, I think, and supporting people to have a, a practice of release, of emotional honoring, I think is so vital. And that's a big part of the work that I do. And that's amazing. And I, I want to touch upon something uh, around what you just mentioned uh, about the emotions and about women specifically, because yeah. I've been doing a lot of this re research myself and reading a lot about lately is like how much women store emotions in their pelvic region. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yes. um, it's a big thing, you know, and it's, it's something that we're not really, it's not talked about. We're not really trained in, uh, as, as young women and how to identify these things. But it's, it's really important to know um, that emotional component to that, that area and, and how, we're, how we're actually holding everything in or resisting or if we're actually letting things go. And for me, it's been a, a you know, I needed to really look into that because of um, being a mom, going through childbirth, having a lot going on in that area, having to restructure that afterwards on a physical level, but also releasing a lot of mo emotions around that. And that's, you know, that's been part of my journey. But um, as a doctor, as a holistic MD, I would think that that would be part of your work too, especially when it comes, <laughs> when, it, when we're talking about food, we're talking about emotions, we're talking about new belief systems um, and restructuring all those things uh, that would have to come in, I would think, at some point as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You're so, you're on it. And I love that you mentioned the pelvis because, you know, we're all powerful beings, women, are incredible beings. Um, the, the, the pelvis, so if you look at Ayurvedic tradition and look at the ch chakra system, our first and second chakra are housed in the pelvis. And the first chakra is all about safety right. and, uh, and a connection to root, to home. And the second chakra is all about creativity and fertility. And you know, women can birth babies, and we do, and we've done it. We've done it since the beginning of time. But women can also birth incredible ideas. Yes. And what I find is that when women are dealing with issues around the womb, around the pelvis, there has been usually some brokenness, some wound around those first two things, around the idea of safety. So a lot of women who have had. Um, abuse or trauma 
in their lives, uh, there is a lot of pelvic wound there, and it can manifest in a lot of physical disease, in um, infections, in infertility, in fibroids. That's a big, a big issue that I work with women on. Or the second issue, when we have felt stuck in our creativity, when we have felt um, suppressed in being able to express our true selves. And women, because of a lot of misogynistic practices in several cultures throughout the world and throughout history, have had to deal with these two main issues, mm -hmm. safety and a suppression of creativity. And mm -hmm. it shows up over and over and over again in the pelvis. So this is, you're so right, Alison. This is why the idea of letting your emotion be heard, sitting with your child, with that inner child, with your inner girl, that girl who may have gone through some things and listening to what emotions are coming up, listening to that with love and compassion and then having a release practice can be phenomenally efficient and efficacious in healing pelvic pelvic um, diseases. Absolutely. So, so do you think this is where the dance comes in? Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, when we talk about release, right? You know, and I, you know, there's all sorts of forms of dance, you know, and I have been privileged to study quite different ones. You know, I got to study ballet and then I was part of a contemporary company, contemporary ballet company in New York, but I'm African. My background is as a Nigerian American. I spent the first 12 years of my life in, in West Africa. So my first movements with dance were hip movements, were the pelvis, were um, West African movements all about getting closer to the earth. They're very yes. low movements. And absolutely part of my healing process was reconnecting to that kind of movement. And my daily dance practice and a lot of my dance performance is about that movement and getting away and healing, healing the, um, I believe, also misogynistic and false idea that when you gyrate your pelvis, <laughs> that has to mean something uh, dirty or over-sexualized. You know, as a young girl, I was gyrating my pelvis and that had nothing to do with wanting to be um, sexy. But that had to do very much with the idea that I understood that my pelvis was part of my body and that I am a sexual being as we all are from yes. the cradle to when we leave. And so Maya, absolutely dancing, I think can be a powerful healing form, whether you watch it, whether you partake in it, or whether you do some form of both in terms of healing some of these wounds. So the history that you come from, um, what do you think the culture is changing from? Do you think they're going to keep their um, dance? Because a lot of things that we kind of hear from um, how in, we influence, Americans influence a lot mm. of cultures is this freedom of um, feminism and kind of a, a empowering ourselves, but we kind of pull ourselves away from the traditions and the cultural things because we're trying to be professionals or we're trying to mm -hmm. uh, create ourselves <laughs> into this being that can, um, you know, do what we want and not be um, trapped by old, um, um, old, old beliefs, right? Yes. So some of the youth comes out away from the traditions and we lose certain things. Do you, did you see that in the cultural when you were over in East Africa and with the, are they still holding on to the traditions or do you feel that they're kind of losing some things? Hmm, great question. So just for clarification, I'm originally from Nigeria and oh, Nigeria. so that was in West yeah, so that's West Africa. And when I did work with MSF, that was in West Afri Africa. That being said, I did work in Kenya as well. So okay. I am familiar with East Africa as well. I would say that um, we're all evolving. Um, we're all evolving in the sense that because I think it's part of the internet, I think youth all over the world, including West Africa, many places in West Africa, are, are actually helping us yeah. older generations to find that amazing meeting place of tradition and complete innovation. Um, and I think our elders can really help with that as well. So this is why I see, um, this is why when I do dance performances, I love to look at and see older people and younger people because I think that there, this intergenerational um, gap needs to be brought together. And I think it needs both. It needs all ages to come together to do, to do that. The youth, 
are blessed with the idea that anything is possible. Right. And the elders are blessed with the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom that came from old and old traditions. Um, but I don't want to romanticize traditions also. There are also some traditions all over the world, including West Africa, that I think are not necessarily healthy um, and that are quite misogynistic. And there are also, alongside traditions such as the, 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 um, the honoring of the feminine in some ways, that are also tradi the traditional, and I think that sometimes can be lost. So it might be a nuanced and kind of everywhere answer, but I think it's because I think that the healing of this needs everyone mm -hmm. and needs a, an embracing of both tradition and innovation with the, with the eye being on how do we honor ourselves? How do we lift up ourselves rather than, um, take us back because again some traditions were not the healthiest or the most um uh supportive of women's freedom women's rights and and therefore everybody's rights if women's rights are being stepped upon everybody's rights are being um, stepped upon whether or not you see yeah. that yeah definitely yeah yeah so i think the second part of that question would be um how we influence um, other cultures' diets by mm. our ideas of how we think is healthy. Yes. And some of this uh, uh, conceptualizing how we should eat correctly. And if you're in a situation where you're not uh, uh, able to stay in context, because a lot of times people take things out of context and say, well, this should be the way we should do it. What would you say was the nutrition factors that you kind of experienced in being in Africa now coming back here and seeing that some of these things don't translate very well? Yeah, beautiful question. I love that question. Um, one of the gifts I was given as a young girl growing up, um, and again, it was the first 12 years of my life in Nigeria, was the connection of food to the earth, right? So the idea that food comes from the earth. I know that sounds like maybe a, an obvious statement, but so many of us have gotten away from that, especially in urbanized um, and even suburbanized um, settings in the Western cultures and Western society. And so we had a farm, we call it a farm, but here it probably would be considered a big garden. And we grew beans and we had corn and we had a mango tree and a grapefruit tree. Um, at that time in my life, I was eating chicken and I, I don't eat I've been now vegan for over eight years now um, is that correct yes over eight years um, so I don't eat any animal products but when we were eating animal products in in Nigeria at that time I remember my mom getting the actual chicken and we had to kill the chicken and then I had to pluck the chicken and 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 take the blood out. So there was a very clear understanding of where, where this was coming from, which I yeah. think, again, is lost to a lot of children and even adults in many yeah. places. Uh, so the connection of food coming from the earth. And I have, I, have, I have the privilege when I work in clinic to work with people from all over the world and a lot of people coming from South America and from Mexico. And a lot of times when I talk to them about healing their diet, I talk about Talk, remembering what grandma had in her oh, backyard yeah. and yeah. talking about eating beans and eating sweet potatoes and what was growing there and getting away from more of the processed things that you can find in the middle aisles of the grocery store. Because all of us, when we go back far enough, here's our connection as a human race. We all come from a tradition of living from the earth. And so all you have to do is maybe go back one generation, maybe talk about grandma, talk about mother coming from wherever she came from. Um, go back far enough and you have that connection. And that's a lot of times how I speak about nutrition is going back to eating real food is going back to eating our cultural ways. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes from a culture of eating processed 
Yeah, and that's where I think when you speak of uh, of tradition, that's the tradition we that we should hang on to, I think, you know, (laughs) those are the kinds. So yeah, I mean, we could get deeper into that question that Maya presented as well. But I think that for me, when I hear you say that, uh, Dr. Toomey. Can I call you Dr. Toomey? I like, I like yes, to say that. Absolutely. People love that. <laughs> okay. I love it too. So Dr. Toomey, I, I feel like when you talk about tradition and traditional ways of cooking, traditional ways that have been passed down from grandmother to, to um, daughter or from mother to daughter to uh, grandmother to mother and so forth and, and, and granddaughter, um, you know, it, it's like, we've lost that. And, and, I remember reading a book years ago, Nourishing Traditions, and it was, it's a great book, even, Mm -hmm. even today, like it has all these stories of traditional cooking and, and where we got these ways of traditional cooking and and where it has been passed down, which cultures and all that. And it's just great because you, then you know, the history behind why we do things. And I think that's what's been lost in our society, especially in the United States, that we don't really know why we're doing anything anymore. We're just doing it because we've heard it from some some guru, some nutrition or fitness guru talking about like, hey, this is the way to do it. Or or doctors that talk about like, this is the diet to lose weight on. This, you know, they write a book about yeah. it. And so, um, but we haven't really we haven't really kept that tradition of passing down um, ways of cooking, ways of creating food, uh, even recipes. I remember when I was younger, my mom had a book of recipes from her grandmother and her mother, you know, and, and I think that has been lost along the way. And even like knowing why we're doing like the purpose behind why we're, why we're putting certain foods together and cooking foods a certain way, you know, it's, it's sad, but, there was a time where there, there's reasons why we put certain things together for our digestive purposes. But even when you're talking about grains, you know, doing, making, uh, preparing them a certain way so that you can digest them. So simple things like that, you know, but they, we don't have the time for that anymore. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love that you just said that was ritual. Um, and, the idea, there's a, there's a great study, um, I think I share about in the book, the idea of rituals. There's a study that showed that when you have a ritual, a ritual around mealtime, mm-hmm. it enhances consumption, it enhances your eating experience, which helps with digestion. And I think as you were speaking, I was thinking that I think what's been lost a lot is the idea of ritual and mindfulness around food. So I speak a lot about about the fact that if we can get back to being clear about the how of eating, we will intuitively get to a place of knowing what to eat. There's so many diet books about, you know, now the big thing is ketogenic. And then there's, there was the Atkins. There's been so many diet fads have come. And I feel like a lot of it is all about, um, macronutrients, how many carbs, how many, how much protein, how much fat. It's so consumed with the, the what and, and being very precise and being so scientific of yeah. what your food should look like. And what we've lost around that is the art of eating and the, the intuitive knowledge. And I think that comes from mindfulness. So a lot of times I will say to people, here's one exercise I talk about in the book. Whatever you choose to eat or drink, because now the big thing is also juices and smoothies, that to me is still consumption. It's still meal. It's still supposed to be nourishment. Whatever you're eating or drinking, to bring to it mindfulness. And the way I I suggest doing that is having a moment of having some sort of moment of gratitude. And that can look for you whatever resonates. Um, and that's something that's been passed down from very different traditions. There was, a, there was the idea of sitting around the table as a family, as a community, as a tribe, as a village, and you have the food and you take a moment of gratitude to the earth, to God, to spirit, to source, to each other, to the farmers, whoever, before you eat a blessing of the food, so to speak. And that's a tradition that I think has been lost a lot. And I think we know science shows ritual enhances its consumption and that enhances digestion. Right. So, so that's one way I think tradition, getting back to that, I think can be very healing. Pay attention to what you eat, to how you eat and how you feel. That's another thing. 
Right. When you're eating and after you're eating. Okay. So people talk about, I want to treat myself with Hagen Dazs. And that's all good. If you want to do that, that is fine. But sit with the Hagen Dazs, put off the TV, put off the computer, and enjoy that Hagen Dazs. And then I ask you, ask yourself how you feel an hour after the Hagen Dazs. This is, and sorry, I'm not trying to vilify Hagen Dazs. <laughs> I was just an say, example. What's wrong ben and Jerry's, pizza, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, yeah, nothing. <laughs> But how do you feel, how do you feel after that, you know? How right. Do you feel after that, an hour after, morning after that, that is part of the eating experience. We yes. talk about treating ourselves, but if you wake up the next morning and you feel terrible, was that yeah. food really a treat? It's true. Yeah, and the awareness around it and really respecting the food, like you, you said, you know, uh, I think blessings before meals have been – you know, we have lost that as well because it's, it's been tied to religion a little yeah. bit, but you know, yeah. I, I think it's good to really show respect for the food and gratitude, like you said, because you are, I mean, if you think about people with food sensitivities too, and, and allergies, there's a lot of emotional stress around that. Like you are taking food into your body and thinking this food's going to harm me, you know, and you're yeah. doing that before you eat it and you think about what are the implications of that? That's, that's huge, you know? So, I mean, and now we're more and more people are being told that they're, you know, that they need to stay away from all of these things because they're going to be harmful. But like you're saying, you have to figure out what works for you and be, so the awareness around that has to start somewhere. Absolutely. Right. And that yeah. begins with awareness. That begins with being present with that eating experience. So you know how that food makes you feel. Right. Um, and one of the things I do with a lot of people is, is identifying food sensitivities and food allergy and the elimination protocol that we'll do over two to three weeks. And that literally looks like being present with food that you're eating and seeing how it makes you feel. That's a big component of that. Uh, the reason why we like to um, bring the t temperature and pulse in is because a lot of times people, as you have worked with, with um, your own self and had issues with eating disorders, is there is a um, blind side that you don't see about mm. certain foods and how you feel. And there's a dogma about, oh, um, you know, this sugar is bad for me, so I shouldn't be eating it. And so there's a connotation to you bringing something to a meal. You sit down and you already have a preconception of what that meal is going to be bad or good for you. And the history of your taking it in and thinking, you know, like carbs are bad and sugar is bad and everything's bad. And we have a, um, a bit of a, a, of a problem knowing that um, we already surpassed our survival uh, warnings like you're already mm -hmm. at hunger and you're already at a place where you are getting signals that are really being misinterpreted yeah so the reasons are um, people have less input that is kind of real to them it more of a subjective mm -hmm. versus a conce conception like of, of, of I truly know so we use the this temperature and pulse to give people the feedback they really do need to see because I could say that meal was fine with me but I actually was, am adrenalized and I'm just so used to it yeah yeah so because my body is what so you're saying always considered running on a so we, yeah it what we're, we're talking about physiological feedback, actually measuring that with the temperature and pulse. So that, that's Got what it. we're saying, but that's how we use science with that, but also your emotional well-being, your disposition in life, those are all good things to pay attention to for how your physiology is functioning because it's all tied together. Absolutely. And yeah. I love what you just shared because I think one way also, I think taking temperature and fantastic. I mean, that's actual physiologic uh, feedback. I also think that being able to strengthen some of that feedback um, or strengthen some of your, mm, your, our, our innate knowing mm. and strengthening those skills, I think is so key. And one of the ways, so this gets away from nutrition and into the realm of, of meditation. And, um, and the reason I bring that up is I think meditation 
is also a powerful way of strengthening that muscle, of strengthening that muscle of how, what do I feel about the situation? What do I know? And, and also um, getting a clearer idea of what to take in and what not to. And this is so key in this day and age of information, information, information. Um, I think meditation, there's a sense of centeredness. Um, there's a sense of oneness, but also boundary that you then can take with you outside of whatever it is, those 5, 10, 20, 45 minutes of meditation out in the world and have greater discernment of what you're being told about that sugar or that sugar or that carb or that protein. And while having a temperature and pulse feedback is fantastic, and I think you should use whatever tools you have available to you, sometimes you may not have that available to you. And being able to check in with yourself and say, what's going on here? I can share with you personally, healing from a disordered eating, this was key for me. Being mm -hmm. able to begin trusting myself yeah. um, and knowing what is my voice versus somebody else's voice. Meditation is really helpful for that. And that's another tool that I share with and guide people through and recommend as not just a stress management um, tool, but one for navigating um, and making choices around food. I agree with that 100%. I think that's half the battle is really uh, learning how to trust yourself because we're listening to all these people who are saying, you should do this, you should do that, right? But again, it's, it's and that's part of the whole process yeah. is, is getting to know your, yourself, your own inner voice, but through meditation, but also your physiolo physiological feedback, your physiology, how, where you are in that process even because it can change and how you're handling stress, yeah. you know? Great. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So everybody, hey, everybody, we had to do a part two because we started having technical di difficulties towards the end of, of our show. And I wanted to include uh, some valuable information from Tumi and, and some information from her about her new book and uh, because she's getting ready to go on a book tour and a dance tour. And I thought that was really unique and I wanted to hear more about it. So that's why I asked her to come back on for uh, just to finish the ending of our podcast. So that's why we're, <laughs> we have different shirts on if you're watching. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thanks again to me for coming back on. And um, uh, if you, let's just start with you sharing with it, us about, you know, what your book is about. It's called Delicious Healing. Yes. And it is, it's, a, it's all about holistic health. And we, you know, I'd love for you to also share some of the uh, things you were talking about that the book had that was very unique as well, where you can access video from it. Thank you, Allison, and thanks for having me back, both of you, Allison and Maya. So the book, um, Delicious Healing, is it's, it's kind of a blend, basically. It's what I would call a holistic wellness guidebook, and it's a blend in which I share my personal healing story. I think, it's, I think stories can be extremely medicinal, and it's one thing for just maybe a physician or a care provider, a healer, to talk about this is what we recommend you do. It's another thing to see that story brought to light. <laughs> so my website is www.drdr2mi.com. And there's an events calendar page. And then you can also find me on YouTube where I share my dancing. I share holistic health, to, um, health tips at The Poem Dances, all one word, The Poem Dances. And that's also my Instagram handle. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks again for coming on. We really enjoyed our conversation with you and um, we hope to talk to you again in the future. I would love that. And again, thank you for what you're doing and creating this space to share. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Toomey. All right. Bye. Much love to you guys. <laughs> Much love to you too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>